My mother had a green thumb and liked to grow things, and that was something she got from her mother, who had an even better green thumb. And I remember, really, uh, from a very early age, I think the first thing that really got me was growing flowering bulbs, uh, like paper white narcissus. That seemed totally miraculous to me. Um, and I really think of, that's something I do every year. I, always, I force bulbs, I grow tulips and daffodils and pots, and they seem to me like fireworks in slow motion. I mean, I love fireworks, and flowering bulbs is exactly that. The idea that this flower is complete inside that bulb and it comes out like that, amazing. So um, then I began you know, doing things like growing beans and watching beans germinate and corn germinate, and I used every little bit of that plot in back of the row house to grow flowers and whatever I could, and I always dreamed about one day having enough uh, ground where I could actually really grow things that I could eat. Uh, so when I first was able to do that in Arizona, um, it's just been, it's been wonderful and extremely rewarding. Uh, so I, I grow a lot of my own food. I think, uh, um, I mean, I'm a great believer in gardening for all sorts of reasons. I think it's good for physical health, it's good for mental health, it gets you outside. And the satisfaction of watching things grow and then actually having things. Uh, also, I, ha I spend my summers on an island in British Columbia where growing is so easy compared to Arizona. I don't have the heart to tell my Arizona friends you know, <laughs> how easy it is. And the day length is so long up there that you can really see things grow from one day to the next. And um, a, a lot of my meals are made by picking things from the garden and going in and cooking. And I cook f fairly simple food, I think. I like bold flavors, but you know, it's simple preparations. And a lot of people who eat my food uh, you know, are, are, I think, quite amazed at the intensity of flavor and they love it. And I think it's just that they've never really had really fresh food that's just come right out of a garden. There's nothing like it. So uh, it, it, that's just something that's a big part of my life. It's something that I, um, I just love. <laughs> and uh, I, there's, even if you're in a city, you can, there's a trend now toward community gardens. Uh, which are great. There's a lot of things you can grow indoors. You can grow herbs in pots. You can grow their dwarf varieties of vegetables that you can grow. It's very satisfying. So I have a, I have a couple of questions about um, growing. One is, is, Jody, you deal with seasonality a lot here in food um, and in incorporating that. I think from the photos we saw, what was true about the U.S. food was that it was very homogeneous. It looked the same from truck stop to truck stop or Denny's to Denny's. Um, so how do you look at you know seasonal and local, and how is that playing into what you're seeing in the bigger food trends, not just at the high end, but perhaps? Well, for one, the number of small farmers um, growing locally has grown trem tremendously. And um, I've been buying from local farmers for 30 years, and in the olden days, it was a guy who pulled up with a truck um, and opened up the back of the truck and big wafts of marijuana smoke came out and then I went into the truck and chose my, you know, squash and onions or whatever. Now it's um, many more of them. Um, I don't know what they do in their free time, but... Um, and they're growing all kinds of things because we have African farmers and Southeast Asian farmers and people who are growing heirloom um, seeds. These are all new things, so it's really exciting to see the variety that's available to us now. And it's, they're pushing the seasons by using greenhouses, by using root cellars, um, and trying to extend our meager little New England <laughs> season beyond the boundaries that we have. So my priority is always to buy local. Um, typically, small local farmers are growing organically anyway. Um, and to pay as much attention to the seasonality of things as possible because, as Andy pointed out, it just tastes so good. You don't have to do very much to it. That's why, uh, you know, Italian food takes great ingredients and doesn't mess with it very much, which is what we do at Rialto over in Cambridge at my restaurant there. So, Beyond that, one of the things that I heard uh, yesterday at the conference that I just really resonated with me was the idea that we weren't supposed to be eating fruit all year. Uh, that, you know, and, and whenever I hear people, everybody says eat more fruits and vegetables, always fruits and vegetables in the same breath. Well, they're very different things. You know, we really want to be eating more vegetables. Fruits are sugar sources. 
And, and if, and we've heard a great deal about the toxicity of fructose and the idea that in, in the natural cycle, traditionally, uh, we would have gorged on fruit at the end of harvest season. You know, when we had this wonderful ripe fruit and that build up fat for the, for the winter. Uh, now we have, you know, we have fruit, most of it, a lot of it tasteless because it's out of season anyway, uh, all year long. Um, that's just an interesting idea. I mean, that's the ultimate paying attention to seasonality. So, so I, I think th I, that even goes further for me because if you read most articles about what people should eat, they pretty much have you eating the same thing all the time. All the Blueberries time, right. every morning, yep. you know, broccoli every single day, whatever it is, right? Yeah. What happens to your health and your diet if you really are eating seasonally? Can you get what you need through the cycle or is there a, a fallow period and a growth well, period. I think our bodies are pretty clever and they deal with things as they come in. And one of, one of the uh, you know, experiences that I commonly have eating out of a garden in the summer, uh, you know, is that I'll have a glut of something at once. You know, I'm drowning in uh, sugar pot, sugar snap peas uh, for a period of several weeks and I, you know, I, they're great and then they run out and I don't have them anymore until the next year. Uh, so that also it makes you appreciate them really when they're there. And, you know, I just load up on them when they're there, and then you deal with the next thing that comes in. Hi, I'm Debbie, and I got to say I love you, Dr. Weil. I enjoy your products. I actually represent them through the Origins Natural Wellness Brand, and um, I also enjoy your vitamins, which I just started taking. I in the uh, Laughter Club is a great idea. Is there an organized or activity around that at this point? Absolutely. Look up, go to that site, laughteryoga.org, and you'll get a list of local laughter clubs. And almost certainly wherever you are, there's going to be one or more of them. Um, so this is, it is an organized activity. There are people who are trained and certified uh, to do this kind of work. Uh, I, I, have, I sort of, as I said, kind of like the term laughter therapy, especially in medical settings rather than laughter yoga. And uh, I'm working to get more research done on it. It's a really good thing. I look forward to finding that. Thank you. Hi, we're from Arizona. And um, first, I think taste is the most important sense of all. And I appreciate uh, all the words of wisdom on that tonight. But um, what I had a question for was, Jody, uh, we have some friends who live out in Concord, Massachusetts. And so coming out here to this conference, uh, decided to get together with them for dinner tomorrow night, and they picked Rialto's, which I didn't know about until <laughs> I came Good to this choice. meeting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and so my question is very simple. I'm a vegetarian, mm -hmm. and will there be a special dish on the menu tomorrow night that I could order? What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Sunny Cave. So this, yes, yeah, Sunny's special dish. Yes, there is. There's always, first of all, lots of um, vegetarian options. In the fr we, we have a traditional Italian menu. So in the first two courses, whether it's a salad or the soup is vegetarian. Um, and then we always have a main that's vegetarian, and it's a gnocchi right now with uh, eggplant and um, tomatoes. Excellent. My stomach is starting to yeah. get ready Yeah, right I've always, now. I find it's really important that we do that because it's the way I like to eat and find that um, lots of our regular guests will move through meat and fish, but often will choose the vegetarian entree as well. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you. Jody had to cook the vegetarian option for Lisa Simpson when she was on Top Chef. That's right. Which kale. surprised everyone, and she did yeah. quite well with that. <laughs> Continuing with the restaurant theme, Dr. Weil, I had another question about uh, True Food Kitchen, which thank you very much for conceiving of this idea. I just learned of it and had the opportunity to eat there when I was in Phoenix last month. I'm thrilled to hear you're opening one in Boston. Can you give more details about where and when? And um, we've got a site that we're, we're looking at in Chestnut Hill. I um, haven't signed the lease yet, but I think the plan would be to open it sometime uh, next year. So if you go to the True Food Kitchen website, truefoodkitchen.com, uh, there'll be information there about that. You're omitting that oh, microphone. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you guys over there. I just got here. Okay. <laughs> I'm Ruth from Carmel, 
California, and I was wondering whether in the humor, uh, whether you know of the humor project. Uh, Joel Goodman, who's from Saratoga Springs, New York, and he's had conferences every year for many years. I went to them several times, and they involved humor and health, and just humor. No, I'm not, not familiar with that. I'd like to know more about it. I, I get their newsletters every month. I'd be glad to give you the information. Thanks. He's very good. Good. Hi, this question is for Dr. Weil. What would you say to a preschool that advocates 100% fruit juice as a healthy drink? You know, um, Robert Lustig, uh, who gave this remarkable talk yesterday about the biochemistry that entraps us, uh, spoke at our conference last year in San Francisco, and it, he was in the public forum. He made a statement that was, I think, quite shocking to many people in the audience. He said that drinking a glass of orange juice, whether freshly squeezed, frozen, or Tropicana, is no different from drinking a glass of Coca-Cola. And that is, in fact, the way it is. Um, that uh, there is an enormous difference between fruit and fruit juice. I would say that's the I think the two biggest nutritional misconceptions out there in our society, first is not understanding the difference between fruit and fruit juice, and the other one is not understanding the difference between a whole grain or a cracked grain and a pulverized grain in flour so that we let whole wheat bread, which is basically colored white bread, have seals on it that says this is a whole grain product. But the fruit juice, fruit confusion, I think, is huge. In California, when there was a grassroots movement to get soda vending machines out of schools, generally they were replaced with fruit juice vending machines. Not that different in terms of um, the impact on the liver and the impact on general metabolism. So, you know, I, if I almost never drink fruit juice. Uh, if I do, I dilute it enormously in sparkling water, and it takes very little in sparkling water to give me a satisfying uh, flavor. So I think just be aware that fruit juice is a concentrated sugar source and a concentrated fructose source. Do you have any and also it's missing the fiber in fruit, and the fiber slows down the entry of that sugar into the bloodstream. So what do you think about appropriate beverages for any age? Beyond water, of course. Water. Water. Water, sparkling water with a little bit of fruit juice in it, uh, herbal teas, or herbal teas that are diluted. You know, this is what I said. I really would like, if, if we could make sugary drinks disappear from our society, uh, that would be, I think, the single greatest nutritional advance that we could, could accomplish. And I think it's doable. I also like uh, club soda, which has uh, some potassium and magnesium, and has a little more flavor to it. You can yep. mix it in other ways. Is it, is it possible for us to try to get people to eat things that are completely insane? Uh, you know, <laughs> um, our culture is really kind of set with what we tend to eat, but there are these other indigenous foods from other countries that are amazing. For example, about three days a week, I eat this stuff called natto, which mm -hmm. is fermented soybeans. I get the non-GMO, the brown and the black, and I chop up onions and scallions and, and cilantro with some Dijon mustard, half <laughs> a can of sardines, <laughs> and half a boiled egg. It's phenomenally <laughs> good. But, it, but, but Andy, you know, this is insane. You can't, I mean, but the food is so good. Four million <laughs> Japanese have this for breakfast every day. I have to try that one. Natto is, <laughs> natto is a kind of hard sell here. Uh, because, you know, it has an, uh, an aroma which some people liken to outhouse and uh, it, that appeals to Japanese sensibilities. However, I like the idea of mixing it with mustard and sardines. I'm going to have to try that. The, uh, I'm all for trying new foods. There is a great deal of xenophobia in this culture, you know, fear of, of the foreign and neophobia, fear of new, fear of new things. Uh, and kids often are get caught up in that and only want to eat macaroni and cheese over and over. Uh, I, I love, I'm a very adventurous eater, and, and I, I don't understand people that don't even want to try things. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a great philosophy with kids is to you know, tell them that they have to try something. They don't have to eat it we had, if they don't like in it. In my family, it was the no thank you helping. Okay, great. You have to have a no thank you helping. Uh, a no what? A no thank you helping. Oh. So which was no thank you 
but I'll have it. <laughs> you know, I mean, like I, I don't really want it, but I will try it. Good. So. Yeah. Um, this question's for Jody. Um, first of all, I only ate once at Rialto, and it, will, it remains one of the most memorable meals I've had. Oh, thank you. That's so nice um, to hear. So, um, when I go out to dinner, I notice, um, and you know, in, in, in fine food restaurants, that um, there's this sort of culture around at restaurants that you go there to indulge. You know, you have all the courses, and um, there's often a lot of rich choices to choose from. And I'm wondering if you've um, thought of, of ways to influence the restaurant world so that um, you know there'll be more healthful, less rich, and sort of intoxicating choices. Well, I think that, that it is happening. I think that chefs, um, for many years, were only interested in um, animal protein and fat. I mean, that's what it seemed, that, that particularly restaurants that sort of grew out of the French culture and, and the way that you made something taste good was to add, you know, a quarter pound of butter. That's shifting, and I hear a lot of chefs talking about their interest in vegetables, they're interested in whole grains, in heirloom beans, and things like that. So I think it is, it is beginning to shift. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of the public that um, still want those rich foods. So, you know, a chef who is has a public that they need to attend to. But come to Rialto or come to Trade. I promise there'll be there's lots of vegetables and and. Uh, Lots of really wonderful olive oils and things like that. I think it is, though. Um, I do think it is. I think it is changing. Do you think the um, uh, the French tradition of cooking they had so much fat in it because their ingredients weren't as good? I mean, why why did that happen? Do you have any idea? That's the that's haute cuisine. It was. Um, I don't think it was because the ingredients weren't as good. I think um, French ingredients are wonderful. I think it was just. Those ingredients demonstrate wealth, yeah. and um, you know, polenta and um, broccoli rabe and garlic and hot red pepper flakes. That doesn't represent wealth. That rep represents food that you ate because you couldn't afford something else. Now, given the choice, I'd go with the broccoli rabe polenta route, and I think that people are finding that as well. And I think that people are discovering. You know, Andy was talking about the way he cooks with bold flavors. Cuisines of the world that um, use bold flavors, I think, are the most interesting. You think about people's interest in Thai food and Japanese food and Mexican food and even Southern Italian food. All of those cuisines have wonderful, complex, bold flavored sort of condiments or spice mixtures that they use. One more question. Hello. Um, Growing up, I was taught to give thanks and bless the food and then ask for the best possible elements to enter my body. Is there an intention, a focus, or a prayer that any of you use? Or maybe a study, like the Dr. Emoto study regarding love and water? Hmm. Well, I said I use that Japanese uh, phrase, itadakimasu, okay. uh, before I eat, which takes a moment and acknowledge as I said, it means I humbly receive, so that works for me. I think you say something that comes naturally to you. It has to be genuine. Um, and in my family, my parents always said grace, and we didn't say grace with our children. And my son, when he was about seven, spent a weekend with my parents and came back and said, why aren't we saying grace? So we've said grace ever since, and it's, um, it's a, something very simple. It's it's saying thank you and, and please take care of anybody in the world who needs help because that's what my son said when he was seven. So, so as a sort of lightning round closing question, what, what ingredient is in each of your kitchens that you think is sort of quintessential to you and you would be so unhappy if you didn't have it? Uh. One? Any? <laughs> three? Herbs. I have to say herbs. Um, Olive oil, garlic. Starting at the basics. 
Um, so thank you guys for being troopers. I know all of you are in the conference started super early in the morning. So thanks for staying with us. Thanks for participating in the laughter. Um, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Dr. Wild. I hope you're all leaving a little bit happier. <laughs>